Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Johns Hopkins trauma surgeon, Dr. Joe Sacrin, joins Dr. Josh Sharfstein to talk about this moment and gun violence. Dr. Sacrin doesn't just take care of shooting victims. He was once one himself. Let's listen. Dr. Joe Sacrin, thank you so much for coming to talk with us on Public Health On Call. You are a trauma surgeon. You have worked on gun violence issues for a very long time. What have the last couple of weeks been like for you? Yeah, well, thanks so much, Dr. Sharfstein, for having me. And um, it's been a really tough couple of weeks. Uh, I think that, you know, when we continue to wake up in America day after day and have to see these senseless tragedies happening, it's absolutely heartbreaking. You know, what we saw this past week was essentially the slaughter of 19 children and two educators. And we know from a public health perspective that this is preventable. Now, it might help our listeners to appreciate your work in trying to prevent gun violence deaths. Could you give a brief overview? Yeah, so I come to this conversation, of course, as a trauma surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital. But I think what's important for people to know is that I also come to this conversation as a survivor of gun violence as someone who, you know, as the son of immigrants that came to this country in search of those hopes and dreams as so many of us strive for, were just absolutely stunned when they found out that their son was nearly killed after being shot in the throat with a 30 caliber bullet. And I think, Josh, you know, that moment really inspired me. It inspired me to want to go into medicine and, and honestly give other people the same second chance that I was given. And I think what I realized that as I kind of went down this professional path was I had the opportunity not just to work clinically on people that were injured, but to think beyond the trauma center, beyond the operating room, to actually provide the best medical treatment, which is prevention. So prevention is on people's minds these days with each horrible detail that is emerging about what the children went through, what the survivors still have in front of them. People are asking the question, what can be done? What is on your list of things that you'd like to see? Well, you know, I have a whole slew of things on my list. And let me tell you why. You know, people will always ask me, they say, hey, well, Joe, like, what's the one thing that we can do? And I know this may be frustrating to hear, but as any public health you know, professional will tell you, any complex public health problem, there is no one solution. And I think that has to be said up front and to be very clear. Tackling this problem requires us to think about this in a multifaceted way across disciplines and sectors and engaging you know, all sorts of folks from healthcare systems to public health departments to private public partnerships. You know, President Biden has been very strong on keeping gun violence prevention as a central part of his platform. Does that mean that there's nothing else that can be done? No, I think, you know, the administration could call on the Surgeon General and ask them to put forward a and commission a Surgeon General's report on gun violence prevention, the likes of which we've never seen. They could ask the Secretary of Health to declare a public health emergency. They could also tackle this similar to how then Vice President Biden tackled cancer with, instead of a war on cancer, a war on gun violence, which then opens up a lot of different opportunities from an administration perspective and an agency perspective. So these are just some examples, right? What can the administration can do? Of course, you know, the alpha in the room is the fact that Congress hasn't passed anything in over 20 years outside of, you know, appropriating some funding. And that's completely unacceptable. Now, I want to put this in context, right? Because, you know, they say, well, they haven't done anything for 20 years. Like, why do you think things have changed, right? 
The reason things have changed, as you know, Josh, is that most governing in America happens at the local and state level, right? And when you look in states all across this country, we've seen, you know, hundreds of pieces of legislation that have passed in cities and states. And that's been fantastic. But the reality is we live in a country that, you know, the states have porous borders. So we need to see those actions. And I think I would say, you know, first and foremost, we know that the Senate is planning on bringing up the expansion of background checks next week, right? I'm glad they're going to have a vote on it. We need our elected officials to have the moral and political courage to do the right thing and to do, frankly, what you know most Americans want to see get done. This is not divisive. You know, you have over 90% of Americans that agree on principles like expansion of background checks. Now, you have spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people, to policymakers, to families, to victims of gun violence. How do you see this moment? Is this just one in a chain of many? What will it take for this moment to be a turning point? Look, I think what it's going to take is, I think it's going to take all of us being part of the solution. I mean, this past weekend, I heard about a girl that, you know, wiped blood on herself so she could pretend that she was dead in case a gunman came back. Like, that's what our children are doing in schools. That's like unacceptable. I can't, you know, I can't accept that. And so I think that we have to like move away from, you know, this idea where everyone kind of goes on living their their daily life and these senseless tragedies continue to happen. We all have a responsibility to be part of this solution. You know, you can't put kind of the burden of this problem on the shoulders of a few. It like requires each and every one of us. That's why, you know, when I talk to healthcare professionals for a long time, I was like, oh, it's too controversial. We can't talk about this, you know, our careers and this and that. Like, we got to get beyond that. You know, we're trusted public messengers. I mean, look at the things, you know, that you've done and so many others in the school of public health at Hopkins and across our health system and across the country, right? It's not just gun violence, by the way. It's all of these social issues that we face. And if we're going to solve them, we have to step up and be willing to have the moral courage to do the right thing and to put people in positions of power that are going to do the right thing. Now, you are a trauma surgeon in Baltimore. We've had a very difficult time recently with gun violence in Baltimore. How does your work in the operating room and your experience on a day-to-day basis affect you know, your sense of what it will take for people to have that moral courage? Yeah, I mean, I think what I see every day in Baltimore is what I think often is being missed, even though the media is trying to do a better job at this. But, you know, we often talk about this issue when we're seeing these mass shootings. But every day in cities like Baltimore, as you're alluding to, you know, we have young brown and black men that are being killed on our streets. And the work that I do here, of course, is so important. I'm reminded constantly, you know, when I'm having to walk into these waiting rooms and to talk to these moms and dads and to explain to them that their child is never coming home again. And, you know, despite, Josh, how good I think I am as a trauma surgeon or how incredible the Johns Hopkins Trauma Center is, there's very little that I can do when someone's shot in the head. And the best way to treat that person is to prevent that injury from ever happening in the first place. And I'm reminded of that day in and day out, which is why it's so heartbreaking to have to continuously, you know, do what I think is the worst part of my job, explain to a mom and a dad that their kid is never going to be, you know, the person that they knew. We're not going to be able to get them back to that baseline, knowing that something could have been done to prevent this. Well, thank you for joining me and talking about this challenge at this incredibly difficult moment. I really do hope this is a moment where people find the courage you're talking about and we'll be back to you to catch up at some point. Thanks so much, Dr. Sharp. Pleasure being on. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. 
production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening. Thank you.